I think it was uh, important for, for me to give Dave a proper introduction. Dave and I have been friends for 27 years. And uh, you know, lifelong friends are few and far in between. Amen. And the fact that when we started communicating and talking about coming back here to Canada, it's like picking up just where we left off. We were campus students at the University of Toronto. And uh, we did some crazy stuff as campus students. <laughs> stuff that I am not allowed to repeat. <laughs> but the things that we did together formed in us a bond that would literally last for eternity. Amen. And Dave, I'm so grateful that you're here today. I'm so grateful that uh, as, we, as I think back as our, on our days on the University of Toronto campus, uh, to, uh, it is just, my mind is flooded with such fantastic memories. Amen. And uh, one of the things that I really want to Im uh, impart on uh, the church here in Ottawa, that relationships, it's what the kingdom of God is all about. And to form deep, trusting relationship, it's what it's all about. Dave is a servant of Christ. He has been an incredible disciple there in uh, Winnipeg for 20 years. And I'm just really, really excited. I give you my friend, a fellow evangelist, a partner in the gospel, David Jung. Thank Amen. you, brother. Thank you. Good to see you, brother. It's the first thing I do, I adjust the mic because they always have it way too high for normal people. <laughs> Greg, good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I mean, my name has been repeated many times. My name is David Jung, and we are from um, Winnipeg. Um, you know, the thing about it is in Canada, sometimes people don't really know what's really outside of Ontario. And then there's, and then, is that near Vancouver? I'm like, well, kind of. It's kind of like you're near Halifax, okay? <laughs> So I, I do this, I do this for all of our American friends. I travel quite a bit around the world and the American says, so what state's that in? I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Stop talking and then we show you. So as you know, you, you're here and, and, and we're here in Winnipeg. You might think, is that, is that really far west? I mean, it's, I, I think we've driven into um, uh, Toronto a couple of times because our family's mainly from there. It's about a 24 hour drive. 21 illegally, but 24 hours <laughs> legally, yes. So that's what we do, and we've come in. It's so great to see uh, Tony and Melanie here. Uh, so wonderful to have you back in Canada, away from uh, uh, all the different things that are happening down in the United States. Uh, uh, you know, whatever, it's a, different, it's a different kind of peace in Canada that we have. Uh, certainly, I'm really sorry for the cold, but certainly in Winnipeg, uh, we don't have a whole lot of sympathy. We actually came here to visit Howard and Karen and Eric and also get some chance to the things, but also, believe it or not, we came from Winnipeg to warm up a little bit. Just a little. Uh, so you mean, yeah, we get cold here too, but not consistently the way we do. Uh, minus 50, that's just Tuesday for us. Uh, we do walk our dog. He does get a coat. A lot of people are like, does he get a coat too? Yes, he does. And we have our coats and we walk outside and we, 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 love, we love Winnipeg. We've been there for 20 years now. And actually, you know, it was actually Tony, somewhat responsible for sending us there. Yep, yep, he was. It was him and the Holy Spirit and another brother named Ron Petter that sent my wife and I there. And we're like, oh my goodness, Winnipeg. And just like a good Torontonian, where was that? And we went out there, and my goodness, uh, we didn't fall off the edge of the earth. Yeah. And uh, we were supposed to be there for three years. That's right. That's right. And some things happened, and uh, nobody moved us, and nobody was itching to come to Winnipeg. Uh, they just were not. And so we've been there, and it's, it's been such a joy. We raised our kids there. Uh, they're just, um, it was just an amazing, amazing group of people there. We don't love the weather, but we've learned to use it because God loves us. And, and you know, warmth, it, it's all relative, right? Uh, actually, I've learned to be a cold weather person. You, you're a Facebook person, you look up, I, I do a lot of ice fishing. Great way to reach out to people. You trap them in a tent for eight hours. They can't really go anywhere. <laughs> also, it's a way to rely on God because really if you're out two, three miles on a lake, if you go in, you're seeing Jesus. It's just the way it's going to be. You're not swimming out of that, right? And so, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's definitely relying on God. Uh, we do have two amazing sons. 
Uh, they're considerably taller than us. Uh, this is where we went to Colorado. They've been so busy uh, with all their hope work and things like that. They, they travel around the world building orphanage and things. Uh, they do, believe it or not, they actually get the height from Erica's side. Uh, Erica is, the, is uh, the, the most normal heighted person in her family. Uh, but our, our kids, uh, the left one, uh, your right, is Alexander, and the, uh, the far, far right one is Gabriel. Uh, you, some of you may know them already. I, I apologize for certain things I'm sure that, that they are to you sometimes. But, <laughs> but uh, they're amazing, amazing kids. And we got a chance to meet in Colorado because that was only the time we got together where we got a chance to pick a vacation spot. And so we end up uh, driving uh, all the way up to uh, 14,115. It's a lot of feet. And so we felt dizzy, and it was a, but it was a good time for us. And so that was the last time we really saw them. Um, so, well, actually, they're over Christmas as well for a short period of time. So that's our family. Uh, they, the, the amazing thing in Winnipeg was they, the, the church was so amazing in helping them become disciples. Uh, they still remember Winnipeg. They don't want to go back to Winnipeg because everything closes at 9 o'clock, and so Toronto is a much more happening city. But wait, wait till they get families and they start seeing that things cost money. Um, <laughs> They might rethink going back to Winnipeg. It's one of the most affordable cities to live, and it's a big city. It's about 800,000 people there. About a million in the whole province, but 800,000 live in Winnipeg because the rest of it is lots of snow and, uh, and crazy things. But what do you do in Winnipeg? Lots of stuff. We're in one of the great ballets, a uh, uh, very cultured place. Lots of, um, we have an amazing hockey team, uh, you know, number one in the Central Division. Uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot about how hockey is going out here for a lot of people, but, uh, but we, have a, a good, we have a very good team, sighted, so I don't want to get killed. Um, you know, I was, I, I was uh, at one point, a Maple Leafs fan, but um, it endangered my life out there in Winnipeg. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't great. People were insulting me, and I had a jersey on. It just really, it was not good. It was not good. So I, 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 I just changed, changed a little bit. Uh, I don't think it's falling away. Not, not to like the Maple Leafs or anything, but uh, Tony thinks so, but it's not. Uh, but yes, but it's survival, and we, do, we have learned to love the Winnipeg Jets. We do have a hockey team out there, it's great. Also, the other things about Winnipeg, we, when we got there on February 19th, 99, 1999, it was the dead of winter. It was a desolate, flat wasteland, and man, we were just, oh no, like what have we done? Um, <laughs> Alexander was about six months old, and so uh, um, we didn't have our other son yet uh, at the time. But boy, when we got to see the church, it was a small little group of about 20 people uh, when we first got there. And I'll tell you, there was like one kid. And we doubled the population of the children when we showed up. <laughs> so we, we thought about it. And the reason why I share, Tony asked me to share a little bit about uh, the church there. Um, you know, we've had uh, ups and downs for the last 20 years. And it's, it's, you know, I am way more comfortable in a group this size uh, than, you know, speaking to the, sometimes I get a chance to speak to a lot of people all around. I mean, we just got back from Texas and Kansas and you know all these American cities. We get a chance to go to all these different places. And I'll tell you, I'm most at home in small places. And, uh, uh, and we, we, we love it because that's where we grew up. That's where we're most comfortable. So when we think of Winnipeg, right, we started in our little tiny church all last year. He shared, asked me to share a little bit. We started as a little church of 63 people that we thought, let's go through the whole, the whole Old Testament in one year. You think, oh, that's, that's no big deal. You got to think, how many here, you've been a Christian 10 years, you've never read through the Old Testament? Because it's hard and difficult to read. We also brought in Douglas Jacobi. That helped a lot, too. If you don't know who that is, we brought him in. He explained a lot of that stuff to us. We didn't really understand most of it, but, but, but it, we felt better about it. But I'll tell you why we had, uh, why I start with this is because about 65, 70% of the people actually completed the entire Old Testament that year. The rest, um, you know, they had for whatever reasons or not, but they're still going for it. And so really, it was an amazing time for the church to see people do that. Um, people in their word, talking about Habakkuk. They didn't know what Habakkuk was. You may not even know what a Habakkuk is. It goes well with fries. No, it, it's, 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 an amazing, it's an amazing discovery for people to see that the Old Testament and the consistency of God's word. But I'll tell you, we saw some really crazy things happen as God was, we learned about God, and really it starts off with God. It doesn't matter what size of a group you are, because with God, you become the majority. And you've heard this before. You think of the smallest things that become so powerful because of what God can do. You, you might think something small is not that big of a deal. Well, you know, I hate mosquitoes. Manitoba is known for mosquitoes. Let me tell you, you have one mosquito in your tent when you go camping, or one mosquito in your house, keeps the whole family awake. Yeah. It's that small, but it's that impactful. But when you have faith as small as a mustard seed, God does amazing things. 
So for our church, we did some crazy stuff. We had our, our Women's Day last year. We had like one-to-one -one visitors, people for just a small group of 20 women. They brought out all these people and they just shared and was run and amazingly it was not run by erica it was run by just a sister she's a nurse she had a vision for it and man it just it blew us away how many people came out of that and uh, it's possible and they're not they're not like they're, they're not full-time ministry they're just regular people in every way and they said let's have a vision let's do this and i didn't have any hand in this except sure knock yourself out yeah. and it was amazing people became so fired up, and we're gonna And so our little church of 63, man, they, they had they had lots of people out. Now you can take a picture if you want, but that's already passed. Yeah, so so that's not coming. The other thing is also what we also got into. We started a, a, a Filipino ministry for any Pinoy out there. We started that ministry because about we have about 10, 15 disciples that are are, are of Filipino origin. Winnipeg City, it's about 60,000 Filipinos there. You gotta think, a couple things. One, it's Winnipeg. It's really, really cold. In Manila, not so much. And they came, and I'll tell you, they were a fired up a bunch of people. We decided to start a ministry there. They've been fruitful. And one of the things they started to do was they started to infiltrate, and I say infiltrate, the community. And they got there, and they got on boards of directors. And they have something called the Manitoba Filipino Street Festival every single year. And we were the only and first church, not even the Catholic church, we were the only and first church that got in there to get a booth for Hope and us. And also last year, we were allowed to have our first worship service there and brought a whole bunch of people there because we had served them so much. They give us $1,500 a year just to clean up garbage for them. And the church is really in there. And I'll tell you, it was a multinational group of people having the Filipino brothers and sisters. Man, it was an amazing, amazing time. And it fired up the brothers and sisters. We also decided in Winnipeg that, you know, why don't we support missions in the Philippines? Because the peso is, is so weak and the Canadian dollar is so strong. And so what we did was we paid a lawyer four or $5,000 and what we did, we created an agency agreement because you just can't send money back and forth, you know, because the whole terrorism thing. Uh, and certainly we sent money over there uh, because we created an agency agreement for a small church. And so any church that wants to give money to the Philippines specifically for missions, they can funnel it through Winnipeg. And so the amazing, the amazing what God did for that, the whole group created that, and so we have that uh, uh, working with them. So we had one of the leaders come, Coco and Relay, and, and his wife come, and they met the mayor, the deputy mayor, they went through all the Filipino communities, and man, it really landed hard on the Filipino community, and they love us, they know us. Our whole programs were highlighted because we did stuff for their orphanages and uh, um, uh, psychosocial, uh, uh, sexual support for some of these abuse victims, because believe it or not, Whenever a, a huge hurricane comes through, not Red Cross doesn't get there first. It's the sex predators and human traffickers. They get there first. And so Hope stops a lot of that stuff through training. Um, we had a, they had a hurricane, 2012, Hurricane Haiyan. And Winnipeg, what we decided to do is we're going to raise some money. And so across some of the chapters all across Canada, uh, Canada raised about $80,000 for them. It went in really a lot. 40000 of that came from Winnipeg. And so it was, it's, it's to, like, that's not that we just suddenly pull out of our pockets, here's a check, right? But it was God working there. So that little tiny group of Filipinos, a group of 15, 20 people, that's what they accomplished. And the other, the other colored people helped out too, but it was an amazing thing. And so we saw, wow, what an amazing place this is. Also, there's a church down in, down in Minnesota Soda called Duluth. It's a tiny church that had like eight to ten people there. And we ended up meeting down with them because we connect in the fellowship to Minneapolis, which is about seven hours away. And so what happened was these, this little church decided, hey, since you guys are such a big church of 63, can you host us? And we're like, are you insane? What are you talking about? So we drove down there to encourage a little church. That's where they meet. Yeah, they have the, I know, you think your facility, it, trust me, they got little workout balls. Uh, that, that, that's, that's their church service right there. I'm not saying this is a bad place, but, but, but you can smell the people who were there before working out, and then we got into church service. But we hosted them. The whole church drove up, and we hosted them, and it was fired. I mean, we're doing the same thing again. But a group of 63 people decided that, you know, we're going to host these people, and they call us the big church. Um, they go to Minneapolis as well, but they love coming to us because our people all got involved and started to love people. And I'll tell you, it was such a fruitful place. So they thanked Minneapolis for giving them money. But they thanked Winnipeg for being such a support. And we're all laughing our heads off at 63 people going, what? wow, that's amazing. And they are in America. They drive across the border. What else did we did? Uh, we were the smallest church ever in North America to hope our first Hope Youth, youth Corps. We had 20, how many? I keep 23. 
24, whatever, 24. It's, it was 20 something. Our church is 63. A third of the people showed up and we had to get all hands on deck. And, and the amazing thing was that was an amazing success. People uh, uh, from the United States, all over the place, and they came and they were impacted. Because what Winnipeg did was part of it is when we had a lot of um, issues with our population there, a lot of p children in care, sexual abuse survivors, all that kind of stuff. And we have, um, the people in the church had a heart for that. So we started developing a partnership with the, uh, the youth and family services out there. And they got us, believe it or not, to revamp their whole, what they call the Exit Up program. And that program has a lot to do with helping 16-year-old foster kids. They're going to be pretty much kicked out of the system at 18. And they didn't know how to do a bank account, basic conflict resolution, basic rental. So all the disciples in Winnipeg, we became the teachers, we revamped their program, and we established a connection with the government agency. And so with Hope Youth Corps, what we were allowed to do, we were allowed to create a two-week program that brought in foster kids in care, and I mean, it was, they've never let anyone do that before, and especially a church group. Yeah. You know how that goes, and man, they let us do that, and we brought Howard and Karen in. They did a top-notch job at the day camp. They were so tired, I think, I wouldn't hear them all night, they were passed out. <laughs> brought in Eric and stuff like that, but that, that was an amazing, we had worldwide impact. We're gonna do it again this year, you know, and this is the volunteers, all of our crew, we had the best food around the world, they said. It was a different meal every single day for seven days, for 14 days. You know, um, a lot of places we heard there was three meals, lasagna, spaghetti, and then back to lasagna with a mix of spaghetti. Uh, <laughs> serious, we had, we had all the people doing that. So this is the group of teens that came in. It was so cool, Alexander, our son, was a global service intern, he led that. So it was really, really cool. He was like, Dad, like, am I gonna get a chance to lead that? I'm like, yeah, you're the leader. Okay, just basically you say, this is my territory, don't mess with me, and we really did. It was really, really good. So we also had the Filipino ministry do something called, anybody know what a boodle fight is? And we didn't know. So it's basically you put some banana leaves, you heat them, you put a bunch of rice in the middle, and you put all these noodles, and this is our backyard, and the Filipino brothers and sisters set it up for 30 feet of tables, and this is what it looked like. Water, I know, right? You're looking hungry, really bad. And then they all ate. They all came and they were fired up and they were showing pictures, they had meat, and boy, it was an exciting time. We didn't do the same thing again. We're like, we asked the Filipino ministry, would you be able to do that again? They're like, absolutely, we're, we're wondering what's going on. The amazing thing what God did for this Hope Youth Corps was that there was a, uh, one of our sisters, a nurse, who ran the Women's Day, and she just was running around the hospital doing some stuff. And this pharma pharmacist guy, he had a lot of money because of the drug thing that was going on for him. Um, he decided that, you know, he heard about the program, and he said, listen, do you guys want like $5,000? We're like, no, <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't need that, right? You know, but we did. And then, and then he heard about the program again. He goes, you know what, here's another five. He dropped like $10,000 in our laps, and, and, and she was calling hyperventilating, and I was like, what's wrong? She goes, they, they, they're giving us $10,000. Who's they? Who's they? The, the people who do the pharmaceuticals. I go, are you sure? Like, like, like are you sure? Do they know what it's about? And they, they did, and it's amazing. And the other thing amazing happened, because you know it's gone. And then uh, the facility rental. We needed to rent a school facility that was all legit for two weeks straight. And the superintendent, one of the, the sisters is a teacher, superintendent heard about our program, she really pitched it. They're like, okay, we're gonna donate like $20,000 worth of facilities to you for two weeks. We're like, okay. I'm not sure if God's working. I'm not sure, but. <laughs> People started coming in. We had people flying in from all around Canada, volunteering. It was just overwhelming us. And you know what? I was not in charge. Now there was my wife. It's a great sister named Kimberly Potter and uh, the crew. And we were just part of the program. And our little group of 63 hosted that. It had impact all around. Why did I tell you that? Because I tell you, when we first got there in our church, one of the things that really um, kind of scared us a little bit, and it got me on my journey, was I would say about 70% of the sisters had been either sexually or emotionally abused severely. It was affecting their marriages. And so really, uh, when Erica came out of the ministry, one of the things I started to do was I found myself really inadequate to deal with some of the emotional needs. If anybody who's ever experienced that stuff or witnessed that stuff, you know it, it is a damage that goes all the way up and down the tree of life. It affects your kids, it affects everything that you do. It affects your whole being. And so, uh, one of the things I started to do is read a lot of counseling books, and after a while I started realizing, you know what, this is kind of silly, I'm reading so many books, I should probably should go back to school. I went back to school, got my counseling stuff going on, and in the end, it wasn't like something I wanted to do, it was we just needed to do it. And it became a, a, a business where I, in order to keep my little license and, and my, my insurance and all that stuff like that, 
I, I, I started a side business. So that's what we did. And the amazing thing was it helped so many brothers and sisters, and it, it started helping people around the world. So I started doing little workshops for counseling around for uh, different churches in our movement. So that's how it kind of started. It wasn't like I wanted to leave Winnipeg. I'm a homebody. You don't move to Winnipeg to be famous. Like, you just don't. And so uh, uh, the other thing along my journey was part of people, they started calling a lot for counseling, but it wasn't really counseling, it was conflict. And so I started reading some books on conflicts, and of course, I started figuring something again. Wait a minute, <laughs> I'm reading a lot of books. So I went back to school for that. And in the end, the place where I was training, they got a chance to uh, see some of the work I was doing, and by God's power, they said, listen, you know, can, can we hire you on as a trainer? I'm like, really? No way. And by God's hand, we worked there for a little bit. There wasn't enough work there. So they referred me to another agency, and I got hired there, and I've been one of their, uh, uh, one of their busiest trainers. And so what I do now, uh, I run around the ICOC a little bit, and I do conflict mediation training, organizational health, and communication. So that's what Tony was all talking about. I say that to tell you that Winnipeg is a little tiny speck of sand, but boy, all the stuff we get to do. Because wherever I go, whether it's in Europe or Asia or anywhere, I tell them, I'm going to show you where Winnipeg is. And they all know. I think it's one of the most famous cities right now in our movement in, in, in Canada. They always know how cold it is. They always know there's lots of fishing. And there's an Asian guy somewhere running around uh, teaching some of this stuff. So if you have a chance to perhaps want to come visit Winnipeg, this is a, a shameless pitch. If we have a whole volunteer corps. Uh, that's for both parents and kids. Now, the thing about it is we only have 32 spots. I think 20-something have been signed up already. So it's not like we're really looking for people. We are. But if you want to come, you know, uh, uh, please come. We're working with kids in care. We're working with the homeless people, uh, people experiencing homelessness. And, and that's, that's what's happening for us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, through all this, you might be thinking, oh, man, you know, you guys such a, you got such a cool church. Everything's going great for you guys. I'll tell you, 2018 was one of the hardest years for us in Winnipeg. Um, just to set up a little bit for us, we, we've had a lot of uh, uh, disappointments, loss, and trouble through even the five-year period in Winnipeg. And some of that is, um, and the people I've talked to, uh, there's no problem for me sharing this stuff, the battles in the church have been huge. Because you don't just do that kind of stuff and impact the community and Satan goes, oh, you guys are great, awesome, just keep going. So some of the damage really came up where, uh, you know, many years ago we had a, a young man who had attended church since he was five years old. He was like Eric's age. He finally came back after having a hard, hard life. And, you know, in the end, um, you know, some things really, really went hard for him. And he had come to a teen devo, and it was amazing. On a Sunday, we had pizza, and, and he came up, and he gave me his pack of cigarettes, and I was like, oh, I, I, don't, I don't smoke anymore. It's not since I became a Christian. I, I, don't, I don't roll that way. Uh, if you don't know about that, I'll, we can talk about that later and how that works. But in the end, um, he wanted to get together with me, and he wanted to get some of his life on straight. Now, for me, as part of, uh, you know, as part of my counseling and part of my own self-care, I take Mondays off. Like, I, you know, I try my best to take Mondays off, or I get in trouble from my supervisor, because uh, self-care is really important. You burn out. And so I said, okay, listen, I can get with you Tuesday, because it's, it's my, my day off. Uh, and, and he was totally cool with that. And then that night, he got drunk, and he hung himself. That was horrible for the church. Like, he killed himself. And it was the beginning of some things. In Winnipeg, I mean, there's a lot of emotional, mental illness within disciples. Um, we've had to commit three people to psychiatric hospitals. Uh, and, you know, because there was, the suicidality was so high. Pills, uh, uh, stabbing themselves, things like that. Uh, sadly, one of the things that happened last year was a brother I used to get with all the time. Um, you know, his mental health really got to him. He walked in front of a train, and uh, uh, he died. And so he, kill, he killed himself last year. It was horrible for the church. We had a sister who was in charge of a lot of the hope stuff. Um, she, she lost her baby at eight months. Eight months. The, you know, the baby's only nine months, right? And, and even uh, a month after that, her brother, young, young guy, 26 years old, working one day and just drops dead. Drops dead at work, like for no reason. They can't even find out what happened. Um, and certainly, it was devastating for us as a small church. A group this size, stuff like that happened. Uh, depression. Um, uh, just, just things hitting people, financial costs, losses, you know, pain. Um, uh, some, of our, some of our leadership were experiencing suicidal tendencies uh, to the point where they had to get hospitalized as well. So it's not hunky-dory, but all this stuff happens through these waves. And if you want to hear more about some of the stuff, but Winnipeg, we went through a hard, hard year. Actually, it was a hard year for me, too. I, I actually um, was hoping to uh, be able to kind of step out of the ministry in terms of being paid by the ministry. 
um, and just to focus on this kind of career, which seems to be benefiting the kingdom a lot, um, and had, wanted a young minister couple to come. And we were promised that, that couple. And, and some things happened. I'm not going to get too many details, but boy, they just didn't come. We had already announced them. They had come to church. We started discipling them already. And they were supposed to start August uh, 1st, 2019. But, you know, through some things, you know, uh, certainly I'm not, I'm not 100% dealt with them all, but they just decided they're not going to come. And it really devastated us because we didn't know. Now I got two jobs. I don't, I, I didn't, like, I can't. And it was really, I, it, was a, it was a painful thing while we're going through all this. But through it all, no matter what your church is going through, the devastation of loss and suicide, and even your ministry go, minister going more crazy than he already is, God still worked. He still worked. So I, I guess I say that to you that, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not oblivious to that there may be some tension and issues going through any little church, you know, conflict and things like that, but certainly Ottawa, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not oblivious to that fact. And I know that I want to encourage you that no matter how bumpy and, uh, you know, crunchy it is, with faith, God can do anything. He really, really can. And I'm not just telling you because the good news we're sharing through all this, the muck and mire, no one saw it until the end of the year, and we talk a little bit about it, and people are just crying. I'm not crying because what God has done, but crying over their own faithlessness to see all together what God can do in the most difficult of times. And I love going to the story where you might have some conflict in your church, some palpable tension. You know, I'm, I'm just saying, a lot of churches have that. I wouldn't be as busy as I am if, if you know, um, if churches in our movement didn't have conflict, even the movement itself having some issues. But I'll tell you, the amazing thing, even when God met Jacob, the first thing God said is, hey, let's fight. Think about that story. He said, let's fight. I mean, can you imagine meeting God for the first time, and all he wants to do is wrestle you? That's a weird, you're like, what? I don't, where's the hug and the sheep and the, no, because I want to fight with you. And, and in the end, Jacob, because he fought well with God, he was blessed. But you remember Jacob, though, he had a bad fight with his brother because he did it the wrong way. The Edomites and the Israelites still hated each other to this day. And so when I think of the opportunities of fighting with God and fighting with each other, if we do it right, see what God can do. So I believe, and I'm so proud of the Winnipeg disciples, the broken, the busted, and the messed up ones, that if they fought right, you know, and when they do, God can do amazing things through them. And I'll tell you, the church runs a lot without myself and Erica. I had 11 trips last year. 11 trips. Think about this. 12 months a year. I had 11 trips, multi-day trips. And man, they did all that when I was kind of not around. And that's them. It's all them. So it's not a one-man show or one-woman show. So hope that gives you a little context of where we're coming from. So we're 63. You're, you're more than that. I'm saying we get you. We get it. You're small. You're a small community. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes you think, what difference can we make? You ask Child and Family Services. You ask the Filipino community. You ask the people who re received money from high end to build a special community center that's hurricane proof. You ask all the brothers and sisters whose mental health have been changed because of God's community. You ask them. It made a difference to them because of the faithful people that were there. And during those hard moments when you don't want to get out of bed, you do it anyway. You know why? Because God said so. So hopefully that's a good start to kind of, you know, give you a little bit uh, of uh, a taste of Winnipeg, we're with you. Amen. And we look forward to a continued partnership with Tony and Melanie. Um, so hopefully that's something that, that will allow you to kind of know the context of what I'm dealing with. It's because we can't do any of this stuff without really following God's truth. If we try to power this through as a human being, we would be dead in the water. We would be dead in the water. And one of the things that we really valued more than anything as we looked at the Bible was truth. Not some philosophical truth. I mean, the truth of God's word. Because we believe what God says is truth. Even some of the major business gurus out there and all the great counseling things, let me tell you, Christians were preaching and teaching that stuff long before these people hijacked it. One of the biggest things for corporations and CEOs now, I'll give you the secret. They're really focused on humility right now. I know. I've, have anyone heard of that? Like that's, right? I'm doing a workshop next year, uh, next, uh, next month for a group of people. It's called Serving Your People. I know! I know! And they're like, you seem to do that a lot at your church. I know, because do you think you can teach that? And this is a big corporation, they're bringing me in. And, and I'm like, yeah, oh, I, I can do that. Yeah, because yeah, it's this really cool concept. I go, oh yes, super familiar with it. Humility, uh, transparency. See, so I'm telling you, if you can bring your... Um, skills of being a disciple into your world around you, it, it's, it's, 
these are thousands of year old principles. They just repackaged and hijacked and called their own. But you know what we're doing? We're going to take it back. So today, I wanted to talk to you, hopefully, about something that will just irritate you a little bit. Because what's the point? If you don't irritate people, then you can just go in the airport and let Tony and Mel deal with it. <laughs> and if you want to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, some of us who have come for, for the first time, you, you didn't get a chance to read the material, and that's perfectly fine. But for those who read it, you know there's a great story that just proves that the Bible is true. There is no other religious narrative anywhere that is as truthful as the Bible. In the Bible, there's incest, murder, rape, arson, conspiracy. You're like, whoa, 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 we, we try to keep our kids away from that stuff. <laughs> then don't open the Bible. There's torture, crucifixion, all kinds of crazy madness. And some people say, well, the Bible's not true. What kind of psycho would write a book to delineate all the faults of kings and queens and everybody in between? Every prophet was flawed and messed up. Even the greatest man of God was a murderer, an adulterer, a conspirator. It was all those things, you know? And I'll tell you, you think our governments are bad? Nah. These kings, <laughs> their record was, and each king did more evil than the fathers before them. If that's a record you want to have, that's what's going on. There was no hope for better. And so if you read the Bible through, you know it, it, it's too honest not to be true. Yeah. So we think of the context of this. King David was a great man. He was a man that was overlooked by his family in the choosing of a king. His father had him take care of sheep. And anybody who's a counselor, you know that kind of attachment, detachment things with father and, and, and brothers. It can leave you a lot of damage and insecurity. He was a guy in that category. He was a guy that, that had a chance to um, be anointed king. And he wrote psalms to God. I mean, he was famous for killing bears and lions to protect his sheep. What a great, handsome, powerful man. And in most Kingdom Kids, this story does not happen in Kingdom Kids because it's a really dark story of King David. And it's prominent in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11. And if you know the story a little bit, King David, he should have gone to war like all, like all the other kings do. Because, you know, it's never dangerous for a man to walk around at night with nothing to do. No, I'm pretty sure, yeah. It's very dangerous. So when you think about what King David did, and some of us who read the story, it's the great story of David and Bathsheba. It's not even that great of a story, not from the point of view of the people who suffered from it. And so we're going to kind of pull our text and our idea from it. It's one powerful idea, this battle for honesty, because I know Tony has been preaching about different battles. And this isn't just a physical battle. This is a battle that, honestly, we may never, ever be in a physical battle. But this battle happens every day from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep because Satan is the father of lies, and that's the opposite of honesty. So when you read in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, you see the whole story, and I'm going to refer to it. And if you don't know what that, that is, I encourage you to read it afterwards, write some notes, and be able to remember some of the points perhaps to consider. But the important point that I'm going to read is that in the spring, chapter 11, verse 1, in the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Key dun dun dun. Like that's the music that would sound. Yeah. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And immediately he averted his eyes because he was such a right. No, shoot, wrong Bible. See, it was a fake Bible, that's what it would say. A true Bible says the woman was very beautiful and David sent someone to find out about her. And this is the cool thing. You've got to notice what happens here. The man said, well, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And anybody who's known Uriah was one of David's trusted men. I think the servant was onto something saying, yeah, um, the wife of someone. Real hot chick, so we should probably be going that way. But of course, the Bible says, then David sent a messenger to get her. She came, with him, she, she came to him, and, slept, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. Uh-oh. So they weren't playing cards. <laughs> if you know the rest of the story, 
David was quite embarrassed by this situation. Remember, David, man after God's own heart, psalmist of psalms, psalmist, you know, great warrior, slayer of Goliath, you know. If you read about his wedding present, it was groom. He was a very powerful warrior. This is what he's doing. You know, in any moment like this, David would have a chance to turn back now and say, you know, okay, I've messed up. You know, I, I, I need to maybe own what I've done. But of course, he chose another route. And any of us who knows what happened, he decided that he's going to try to trick Uriah into sleeping with his wife and cover up, you know, the pregnancy. Wow, he kind of looks like the king. <laughs> wow, that's weird. You know, like, can you imagine? Uh, it's possible. That's what he's trying to do. Remember, Jerusalem, you've ever been there, is not a very large place. And so anyway, King David decides to do that. Uriah, being a righteous man, said, no, no way, man. This is paraphrasing, of course. All my men are freezing out there. Out there, I'm not going to go, you know, hang out with my wife and, 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 and get into that. No. And David's like, oh, come on, you righteous loser. Like, I've had enough of you. Tries to get him, ply him with the alcohol. Even when he was drunk, he said, nope. Wow. Wow. So he was a, a righteous drunk even, which is even possible. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm not saying that you should be righteously drunk. But here's the thing. <laughs> King David... Try to do this, and finally, you know what? He did the, he did the other option. He, he, he talked to Joab and said, yo, Joab, I got this great battle plan, okay? What you need to do is you're going to go up and rush against the wall. Generally a stupid idea. And then what's going to happen is when you get close to the wall, I need all the men to back up, but don't tell the buddy Uriah. And you back up, and he's going to, things will happen. Yeah. And guess what happened? Uriah got killed. Wow, unbelievable. And then Joab decides he's going to tell David, uh, you know, we had a really unsuccessful day today, one of them bad days. And because and, you know, generally gener generals are going to be accountable for doing stupid things like that. But he goes, and, and Uriah died, though. Oh. And David's like, oh, man, you know, oh, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> Stuff happens. And, 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 and in the end, David had the, took his wife, he had the audacity to take his wife, and everything went fine. And then Nathan shows up, dude, you did wrong. And you're going to be cursed. You're done. And from there, if you watch the rest of David's story, Amnon, Tamar, the whole mess, his, whole, his son, all the stuff that would happen, because God said, you brought the sword to Uriah's house. You know what? I'm not, I'm, I'm, the sword will never leave your house. And God still worked, because Bathsheba would later on have Solomon. And, and you know that went well for Ishti for a while. But in the end... This is the whole story that affected the kingdom of God. If you know the story, David was the forefather of Jesus. This falling, this, this destruction of this family could have been huge for us. Because if David's and the ancestors of Jesus died, there would be no Jesus. Just do the math, how that would work. Communion wouldn't make sense. Because there'd be no lion from the tribe of Judah. It wouldn't make any sense at all. So you can see this is a big deal for Satan to try to work. But the question is this, and I'm going to focus a little bit on because. A lot of people would say that the kingdom really fell and hurt when King David to be, decided to be so unrighteous. Because it's really inconceivable for me to have a powerful man use his power to corrupt it and use it for sex. Have you ever heard of that? A powerful leader ever using, like, I've, I've never, have you? Because I, I tell you, I, tell, yeah, I know, like, powerful men and women abusing their power for sex, money, and power, please. That was like a Wednesday in Israel. That happened all the time. It gets, I, I'm not saying it happens today in society. We are in Ottawa, though. A lot of questions are being asked. But it's being overshadowed by what's going on down there in the States, as we know. So the question is this, when did it really fall apart? The question it comes down to, was the palace locked? How did Bathsheba get in? You know, like, remember, it's a small place. Because David, I'm pretty sure, locked his palace because he had a lot of enemies. You go around killing everybody around, there's going to be assassins that come his way. So here's the question. How did Bathsheba get through all that security to get to his room? Oh, you know, I was wandering around. Oh, we just showed up in your room. I got it. The messenger went and got her. So the messengers went through the secret passageway and pulled one of those Rapunzel things and climbed up. Is that what happened? You know that's not what happened. Maybe Bathsheba was a ninja. She got in through the window. She climbed in like smoke and said, David, here I am. You think so? Of course, all this is nonsense. We know what happened. 
When did the kingdom fall? People who saw stuff didn't say a word. You notice the, the servant tries saying it. Hey, uh, his wife. Should have figured it out right then and there. Sent the messenger. Oh, you need to go get that lady. What lady? Um, um, Uriah's wife. The messenger should have said, okay, wh wh why, why would the king want to see the, the wife like around this time? Is that like a normal meeting thing? Is that normal? No. I think she wanted to ask advice about bathing techniques. I don't know what he wanted, but something was wrong. Do you think that he was that lucky? Maybe just one time she got pregnant? I'm thinking this was a long time sordid affair. More than one time, I'm guessing. Did she ninja her way in? Was the pals, you know, guys, you can take the night off. You got to think about that. It's conspirators. Here's the other interesting thing. Joab was amazing as a general. You think you've heard of stupid battle plan? I bet, I bet you he has. And he's, I'm, I'm not going to let that. But guess what he did? You notice he didn't ask a single question. Now either he got all of a sudden stupid, or Israel was so small, everybody already knew. So my question is, why didn't anybody say anything? You know, I love it when I go into a church or an organization, and the people I interview always tell me, oh, we saw that the whole entire time. Now, with the secular groups, I don't really go gangster on them and go hard on the Bible, because they don't like that, okay? For the Christians, I ask, well, how many of you really saw this going on with your leaders or your followers or the culture of the church? And they're like, oh, yeah, we saw it, blah, 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 blah. And they're filling all their 360 surveys, and I'm like, so how many actually spoke up? Well, we really tried. I'm like, you tried. Like, how did you try? Effectively try? Like the servant tried. Um, you know, I, uh, 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 that's what it sounded like. David's like, no, go get her. Can you imagine a righteous man or woman saying, no, David, that's not going to happen, dude. Sure, he could have died. But you know what? What did he have died for? He died in his battle for honesty. I'm not so sure King David would have killed him. I don't know. He might have said, oh, I was just kidding, guys. Oh, it's just testing your righteousness. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. But we will never know. Let me tell you, when the kingdom falls is when people go quiet. And they don't speak and they don't say anything. I think that's what happened. And it was a conspiracy of silence where everybody was quiet. I'll tell you, in our society right now, that's what you see. The Catholic Church is having a few problems here and there. Yeah. It's in the news. I'm not being slanderous. Just, just, just open CNN. It's even on CNN now. They had a conspiracy of silence. Conspiracy of silence in our governments. It's hiding around everywhere. It is prevalent. Do you think that that kind of inability to tell the truth, the inability to be honest in the world doesn't somehow leak into our churches? You gotta think, you gotta wonder, what does this mean? I, I, wanna, I wanna show you a video that we got. That's a cue for the lights, just in case. Okay, uh, um, I'll show you a video that they took uh, two years ago at Western Washington Universities. Um, and honestly, it was a society of our best minds. And they were asking simple questions. Now, once again, this is a disclaimer. This is not making fun of gender fluidity or transgender anything or people identifying, but it's the people that were being interviewed. I want you to watch their faces of what they say and what you think they really believe. There's been a lot of talk about identity lately, but how far does it go? And is it possible to be wrong? We went to the University of Washington to find out. Are you aware of the debate happening in Washington State around um, the ability to access bathrooms, locker rooms, spas based on gender identity and gender expression? I, I think people should be able to have access to the facility. I think uh, bathrooms could and potentially should be gender neutral because there doesn't need to be a classification for differences. I think people definitely should have the ability to go into whichever locker room they want. Uh, I feel like at least public universities should do their best to accommodate for those who do not have a specific uh, gender identity. You know, whether you identify as male or female and whether your sex at birth is matching to that, you should be able to utilize the resources. So if I told you that I was a woman, what would your response be? Good for you, okay. Like, <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you. I'll be like, what? <laughs> really? I don't have a problem with it. I'd ask you how you came to that conclusion. If I told you that I was Chinese, what would your response be? I mean, I might be a little surprised, but I'd say, good for you. Like, yeah, be who you are. <laughs> I would maybe think you had 
some Chinese ancestor. I would ask you how you similarly came to that conclusion and why you came to that conclusion. Um, I would have a lot of questions just because on the outside I would assume that you're a white man. If I told you that I was seven years old, what would your response be? Um, I wouldn't believe that immediately. Uh, <laughs> I probably wouldn't believe it, but I mean, I, it wouldn't really bother me that much to go out of my way and tell you no, you're wrong. I'd just be like, oh, okay, he wants to say he's seven years old. If you feel seven at heart, then, <laughs> then so be it. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> so if I wanted to enroll in a first grade class, do you think I should be allowed to? Uh, probably not, I guess. I mean, unless you haven't completed first grade up to this point and for some reason need to do that now. If that's where you feel, like, mentally you should be, then I feel like there are communities that would accept you for that. I would say so long as you're not hindering society and you're not causing harm to other people, I feel like that should be an okay thing. If I told you I'm six feet, five inches, what would you say? That I would question. Why? <laughs> because you're not. <laughs> no, I don't think you're 6'5". If you truly believed you're 6'5", I don't think it's harmful. I think it's fine if you believe that. It doesn't matter to me if you think you're taller than you are. <laughs> so you'd be willing to tell me I'm wrong? I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. No, but I say that um, I don't think that you are. I feel like that's not my place as like another human to say someone is wrong or to draw lines or boundaries. No, I mean, I wouldn't just go like, oh, you're wrong, like, that's wrong to believe in it, because, I mean, again, it doesn't really bother me what you want to think about your height or anything. So, I can be a Chinese woman. You... <laughs> um, sure. But I can't be a six-foot-five Chinese woman. Yes. If you thoroughly debated me or explained why you felt that you were six-foot-five, uh, I feel like I would be very open to saying that you are six foot five, or Chinese, or a woman. It shouldn't be hard to tell a five nine white guy that he's not a six foot five Chinese woman, but clearly it is. Why? What does that say about our culture? And what does that say about our ability to answer the questions that actually are difficult? Scary, isn't it? This is not from the ninth. Like, I mean, it's recent, and then some of the best minds. I'm not saying this happens in Ottawa. People are politically correct. You know, I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's in the U.S. They've got a lot of problems. But let's pretend. <laughs> let's pretend in society that in Ottawa and the rest of Canada, it's very politically correct. So if I'm a six foot five Chinese woman, it'd be perfectly fine. And if I wanted to enroll, in the, I mean, Eric seven. I can identify as him and I can do whatever I want. I'm not talking about people who are mentally ill. I'm talking about people on, on their faces. You saw, I'm not saying that on camera. That's, that's what it is. I'm not gonna tell you. In different contexts, they have different truths. That's not truth, that's dishonesty. You know, the biggest things we worry about in the teen ministry is hypocrisy in the home. Because that is the poison of the teen ministry or the youth ministry. Because they see church dad and they see home dad. They see church mom and home mom. They know who you don't like in church. But here's the thing. You're an honest person. That person would already know because you've shared with them and you're trying to work it out. Your kids don't, they shouldn't know more than the person you have to deal with. God's truth is a very powerful thing. And with the battle for honesty, the battle to move toward God's truth is something that we do every single day. And it's interesting, even the world that I train for, the secular world, everything they do, they, they think it's some brand new idea. It's not. Transparency. You know what that means? To be open. You know what? Mentoring is the biggest thing. We call it discipling. I know that's a bad word now sometimes. We call it discipling. Right? You know, they, they have CEOs that ride not in the first class. They ride in the back now. That's called humility. Like, there's all these different things. And, they're, and they, they, they get awards for it. And they get heralded for it. And I'll tell you, that's the place that celebrates it. But is it celebrated in church? You see, what else? The battle to deal with obstacles that get in the way of speaking God's truth. That's also another battle. It isn't just my ability to speak, but anything that gets in the way is the culture in the church is not an honest culture. What will define us? Our, inter our multiculturalism, please. There are so many organizations that are way more diverse than us. Our level of, level of acceptance, please, we're not going to win that game. What else? 
Uh, it used to be we're sold, 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 sold. I don't know how many souls there are sold out. Like, I don't know about that anymore. As soul, and we should be. There's all these target values that we have. But really, our DNA tells something different. It used to be the fastest growing. Yeah, I, would, I would challenge the numbers on that. Not happening. We used to have all these little different definitions. I'm wondering, what if we could define ourselves this way? That the battle of honesty is always going to be in the church. We're going to battle and we're going to win this thing. We're going to win this thing. Because I'll tell you, the number one thing, the number one tool Satan uses against Christianity is, is, is a lie. Yeah. Think about the things that got Eve. It was a lie. Yeah. It was a lie that got Eve. So sometimes in mental health, we deal with lies all the time. Lies from your, you know, an adverse childhood event, an ace, okay? It's a lie. When your father or your mother did this, they told you something, it's a lie. And it stays with you and affects you until you're 55 or 65, until somebody breaks down that lie. Can you imagine that being so prevalent in church that we're church one way, but really, this is what we really do? Yeah. Yeah. See, what's the difference between us and the, hi the hypocrites, the, 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 the Pharisees? Sometimes the power of honesty it's not being harnessed in the church, and that's why it's impossible to get deep. You can be here in a church for 20 years and not feel any deep er than, than you when first arrived. It's because the level of honesty has never gotten there. Like, are we there yet after 20 years? Can I actually say something to you? Can I be honest? Can I be honest? No. Then you know what? What can I do? What's the next step for me to be more honest with you? Can I do that? So this is something to think about. It gets a little prickly sometimes. You know, you think, oh, I'm an honest person. You sure? Are you sure? See, being honest, it's not about being mean or cruel, but it's the ability to feel the spirit and say, you know what, I saw something. At the very minimum, I'm going to check on it because I love my brother and my sister. If you think someone's drowning, you go, oh, I don't know. It looks like they're having fun. I check. I'd rather be mistaken, don't you think? Yeah. Right? Do you know when they have an amber alert? A lot of people get stopped. Hey, man, is there, that's my child. With the amber alert, everybody checks everybody's kid now. Do you know why? Because just in case. Just in case, that's the kid you're looking for. Well, what about in church? Can you imagine those visiting for the first time? They feel the sense of brokenness in the church, but there's honest brokenness. They have this quote, the church is the only place where it shoots its wounded. It's like, what? You know, it doesn't make any sense. You know what, maybe healing the wounded. We can't heal the wounded without truth. Look, man, you're dying of cancer here. You need to settle your house. No, 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 you're great. That blue and green thing growing your leg, nah, it's normal. It's normal, and people die. God destroys prophets when they're lying prophets. They tell people peace, peace, when there is no peace. So this stuff, I, I'm just, I mean, it's in Winnipeg. We try to deal with it, and it helped us have the year, because when you read the Bible, it brings truth. So when do you think this dishonesty starts because of feelings and stuff? And who are the most honest people in the world? I know, children. I want to show you another video. I want to see some. This guy's named Sam. He's kind of a, a, a social scientist, he's a young guy, and what he did was, for those who miss it, he baked some brownies, some really nasty brownies, and he brought some of his friends, some of them were young as Eric, okay, and he gave them brownies, he wanted to see if they'll tell him the truth, okay, and you'll see, children are the most honest, let's see with the theory. Volume? We all know adults stink at talking about tough things, but how about little kids? Here's my experiment. Feed kids wretched brownies, then see if they'll tell you the truth, especially when they think it might hurt your feelings. First I made the brownies. Lots of chocolate, eggs and flour, but instead of sugar, I put in salt. Lots of salt. There's no way they could like these better. Now I recruit kids of various ages for a taste test. I tell them I want to compare ordinary brownies to my special brownies. My dear grandmother's special recipe. My dear dead grandmother's special recipe. Then I give them a dollar for being such a big help. My parents always taught me that if you want someone to like you, give them money. Okay, here goes. First they ate the yummy sugar brownies.
Next, they eat the salt bricks. Watch this girl. She can hardly keep from gagging. And now for the crucial moment. Will they tell me the truth and possibly offend me? I asked them to point to the brownies they like best. No surprise that some tried to spare my feelings. But watch, even the one who gagged? And how about really little kids? But do you want to know what they really thought? Here guys, I have leftovers. Does anybody want seconds? So, how many were surprised? See? Where does it start? Some of those kids, six years old. They know how to lie to spare a feeling. They already know. They probably just learned that in school. Maybe. Probably at home. Does that kind of rethink, make you rethink Kingdom Kids even? This is not one or two kids. Almost every one of those kids lied. They flat lied to spare Sam's feelings. So you don't think it's a problem? Well, you know what? Because probably when around 15, they'll grow out of it. What do you think? 20? 25? It's almost like we have the audacity to be surprised when we have a lying 30-year-old when they've been doing it since they were six years old. But for good reason, though. The good reason is to spare someone's feelings. Because you love them and care for them. You know, it's interesting. We want to be full of grace, as the Bible says. The Bible says the Word became flesh. This is talking about Jesus. And made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let me tell you, when we walk into a church and we don't see grace and kindness, we see, if we see uh, 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 people that are segregated and mean to one another, and we we just cry out, we're like, where's the grace in this church? And we're adamant about bringing grace to the church. And amen. We need a loving, kind, accepting, graceful church that we, you come as you are. But you can't stay as you are, but you come as you are. But here's the thing, though. When was the last time you lost your mind over a church isn't full of truth? Equally. This church has no truth. I don't mean some crazy flat earth truth of yours or aliens and KF, you know, like, where's JFK? I'm not talking about those kind of truths, okay? I'm talking about, like, hey, you know what? The Bible says this is wrong. Period. I will debate you. I'm open to being wrong, but you've got to show me from the same Bible you read. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian who never reads their Bible, never goes to church. Yeah, but those are all works and stuff like that. Oh, well, I'd love to debate you on that. Like, can we say those things? But no, 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 no. Save it. We're gonna, I'm not saying to nail the first-time person that doesn't have a Bible. I walked in as an atheist. I probably would have been freaked out by that conversation. But someone's been out years. We don't have that conversation. When are we going to have it? When the brownies are really nasty? When the brownies are bad enough? Is that when we do it? See, we have a church full of grace, and we've moved toward that. We're a much more accepting and kind place. Our whole movement's been that way. What we threw out the other side was somebody coming to you. Hey, that's a lie. That's not true. That's a lie. That's a lie. I had one sister, a very dear friend of mine, and we deal with her sometimes. She walks in all insecure. Because one of her greatest insecurities is that, you know what, when I walk in, n- not everybody in the room is going to like me. And I'm like, oh, whoa, that's terrible. I can totally get her anxiety. She's afraid. And I'm, but but I, I, I turn around, not, not by my hand, but by God's grace, and I ask, let me ask you something. So do you like everyone you meet? No. Well, that's odd. So you expect everyone to like you when they walk in the room, but you don't like everyone you meet. And she's like, <laughs> I never even thought of that. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) That's true. I said, can I take it even further? Do you even like yourself at times? No. So you expect people to like you when you don't like you, and you don't like the people, and you get to randomly choose who you don't like, but yet somehow everyone's got to like you. Can you show me on a map how that would work? And she's like, hmm. Amen. I appreciate the truth. It wasn't harsh. I didn't even say anything. I I only asked five questions. I never said, you're a loser. I said, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me. Why would you say that? I'm just trying to understand. Enlighten me, please. Sometimes speaking the truth, it's a lost art. 
It's not that it's not possible. Let me tell you, my wife shared, it got a man killed. You don't get hanged on a cross being tortured all night long because you speak niceties. You just don't. I'm not saying that we're harsh and we go the other direction. We chase people away. You know those guys in Las Vegas in the corners? Repent! You're all going to hell! Like, you know, okay, like, nice job, buddy. That's a bit psycho. I understand that. But there's a moment in time when I'm going to decide, how am I going to at least take one step forward into moving to the point where I can speak to you and say, brother, I'm not going to do this 100% right. Sister, I'm not going to do this 100% right. But can I share something that I see? I just want to check in at the very minimum. So you think. The scripture says don't lie to each other. Since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self, that's what becoming a Christian is. Which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its, its creator, Jesus Christ. Our standard of truth is not the other person beside us. The standard of truth is Jesus. My wife shared her conversion was not just a conversion of bringing the twins back together. It's a conversion of mine where she has to be able to have this two-way street. Where can you imagine being sharing the same womb, but you can't share the same truth? That's what was causing her just, you know, um, the, 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 the distinction between them was holy and unholy, right? But when they became holy again, that means separated. That means the relationship's got to be different. And we find ourselves, because we love the person and we have sentimentality toward the person, we won't say what we need to say. Let me tell you, especially when you're older Christians, 20, 30 years, you've probably stopped sinning by now. <laughs> probably don't struggle with your quiet times of 30. You probably got it mostly covered. When was the last time someone had the boldness to say, hey, listen, how are you doing with your God? Because, you know, I'll tell you, you can be 50 years old. The problem is when we do something like that and we see the problem and we don't even begin to address it, the scary thing is they see we see it. That's scary because now they know that we give them consent to do what they're doing. Okay. Now, after consent happens, you know what happens? They get permission. Permission is formal consent now. So it's now it's being established as a rule that you can say those unfactual things or near truth. And once consent and permission take hold, it becomes part of the culture of the church and the society. I want you to look at American politics. What is news anymore? What's, what's true? What's real? You don't even know what to watch. Because you don't know what happened. You don't know what happened. It's because it's part of the culture now to have to filter and to check out every fact that is brought up now. That's ridiculous. Sometimes in church, though, it's become part of our culture not to speak the truth. And when I preach this message in other places, well, there are a lot of angry faces. So how can you come and judge us? I have not said nothing about the Ottawa church. I'm speaking specifically about the Winnipeg church. That in our culture, there are times of things that people are, they consent and give permission in culture to. You know, I'll tell you, I am, I'm a professional presenter, and I'm really, really uptight about my technology. I really am. Partly is my own issues. I don't want to look bad. And if my technology goes all awry, I look like an idiot. I hate that. And it's all about me, because that's what, that's what I get hired for. It's all about me. And I remember, I would, my wife would call me out. I would be visibly upset if the slide didn't go right. Like, I, I, just, I just feel it, because it's all about me. It doesn't matter if the guy in the back was pressing all the wrong buttons. I would be mad as I'm preaching the word of God, filled with anxiety and anger and upsetness. I remember the, the, the tech guy, the brother, he's not a big leader of any sort. He called me out and said, listen, David, I understand, you know, um, does it have to be perfect for you? I don't have, it doesn't have to be perfect. He goes, yeah, it does for you. And I don't think that's righteous. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Who are you? You're a tech guy, you know? No, he's a Christian. He called me out. And I felt like such a fool. And I said to my wife, hey, is that? He goes, oh, yeah, you're like that. My leaders are like, oh, yeah, you, you get like that. How come no one's told me? You know, for the longest, no, no, it's not that bad. Let me tell you, it happens all the time. Can you imagine standing in front of 45 million people and singing a song and cats dying sound better? Why would you go and embarrass yourself? It's because look who's in the backstage. You got grandma, grandpa, you get your barber, your, your pet groomer, you're the best singer in the world. And here's Simon Cowell, excuse me, 
if you have a voice coach, this guy, he should be shot like that. <laughs> Why would this person get a chance to do it? Because people tell him he's a good singer. The poor guy goes up there and he embarrasses himself. So what happens? In the church, there are people, they're being told that they're this, this, and this, because nobody tells them that. It's become part of the culture. And then when somebody finally tells them, they lose their mind on that person. But why? It's because it's a conspiracy of silence. Every one of you that knew, you're in it too. You're a liar. You're not truthful. See, what has become culture in the family as you remain silent here in the Ottawa church? What's become part of the culture? You might go, oh, if you're not comfortable now, I want you to think about what's become culture. Like, part of it is, how safe are you? How safe do we make it? Because sometimes what happens is we're afraid to speak, okay? Because it's not created safety. As a leader, you know what? I have to invite that. Sometimes I have to even offer some of my weaknesses. Am I doing that whole crazy slide thing again? They're like, if their silence tells me a lot, okay. You know what? I need to stop that. I need, I need to. So, you know, for the last, for, for a little while after that, I stopped using PowerPoint for a while. I stopped because I had to just get my heart right. Because I just can't be so stuck on what's behind me and not focus on God. So I'm going this way, worried about every spelling mistake, or whatever like that. I, I know, that, that's therapy. I get that. Thank you. I know that, all right? So we'll work on that OCD-ness, right? You've got to have a little bit to be successful, but not over the top. But in the end, we have to make it safe for ourselves. And part of the safety does involve, you know, um, creating that safety in the church because it doesn't exist. Well, how safe are you? How safe do we make it? So when people don't tell you stuff, you've been a Christian for a while, and they've never addressed anything sinful, then it's so amazing to meet you, Jesus. Because that's who you are. You must be Jesus. Because whenever there's a fight and involves Jesus, there's only one person wrong. I get that. But whenever there's a human being involved, it's usually two people wrong. So King David made it incredibly unsafe to talk. That whole murdering bit, I, can, I understand. I understand. I'm not going to go and talk to him, because the last guy... He got, his, he, he got killed, okay? He went into a battle. But here's the difference. Isn't, isn't Jesus the king now? Who is above Jesus now? No one. And so when we have Jesus' church, you know what that looks like? It means that I'm, I'm going to come on behalf of the king. Not in an arrogant, weird way, but all authority in heaven has been given to me to go make disciples. Not only make them, but to teach them to obey everything. That means not freaking out over a slide losing it. That means that if I'm not the man of God I need to be, I need people around me, and I need to create it safe for them to come talk to me. And as a disciple, you know, if Jesus is our king, then creating safety should be one of our great things where under the umbrella of grace and truth of Jesus, can we speak? Because if we can't, then that's why church is boring. Because nobody gets anywhere, right? We keep digging around, keep digging around. I want to show you one last video that it's really cool, and this is from a psychologist. Her name is Brene Brown. A lot of people heard of her. And it addresses something very powerful about creating safety when it comes to speaking truth in the church. I haven't told you what truth, because I don't know the Ottawa church well enough, but most likely it has some truth to do with our missing relationship with God, our hurts with different people, and the way we're dealing with people. But I want you to listen to what Brene has to say about this vault and being safe to speak your mind and your truth. vault. The vault. What I share with you, you will hold in confidence. What you share with me, I will hold in confidence. But you know what we don't understand? And this came up over and over again in the research. We don't understand the other side of the vault. That's only one door on the vault. Here's where we lose trust with people. If a good friend comes up to me and says, oh my God, did you hear about Caroline? They're getting a divorce and it is ugly. I'm pretty sure her partner's cheating. You have just shared something with me that was not yours to share. And now my trust for you, even though you're, 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 you're gossiping and giving me the juice, now my trust for you is completely diminished. Does that make sense? So the vault is not just about the fact that you hold my confidences. It's that in our relationship, I see that you acknowledge confidentiality. Here's the tricky thing about the vault. A lot of times, we share things that are not ours to share as a way to hotwire connection with a friend. Right? 
if you don't have anything nice to say, come sit next to me. You know, that's <laughs> our, yes or no, like our closeness is built on talking bad about other people. You know what I call that? Common enemy intimacy. What we have is not real. The intimacy we have is built on hating the same people. And that's counterfeit. That's counterfeit trust. That's not real. I found it convicting for myself. Um, but I wouldn't say confidentiality. I would call it safety. I don't promise confidentiality to people because I don't know what you're going to tell me. But I promise safety that I'm not going to tell anybody that doesn't need to hear. Because I'm a mandatory reporter as a counselor. You, you can't tell me certain things. I got to tell people because I'm not going to jail for you. I don't promise that. Sorry. I'm not sacrificial, like, you know, like that. But you tell me something. And you start, I said, listen, have you told the person? A lot of people say, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I've told them already. But are you telling me with the same intensity that you told them? A lot of times they'll tell them, but not with the intensity that the person would understand how much you really feel about the situation. Bro, I'm so mad at this guy. How'd you, bro, you know, I got some things that you did didn't work for me. Like, it's, it's two different things. Did you tell this person? Are you coming to me for advice? Because you haven't asked a single question. You're just telling me the whole, are you, am, I, am, I, am I the vomitorium? Am I being dumped on? No, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. You need to work some of this stuff out and ask me a question. Ask me a question. That, co that gossip culture is destroyed more than you think. It breaks trust. And all of a sudden we form tribes. And man, I love it. I'm a professional mediator. I hear that. You know what I hear? Cha-ching, cha-ching. That's what I hear. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know, I'm like, whoa, look at that guy. Totally losing his mind, gossiping. It, it is a lot of money coming our way. People need to pay people to have conversations with people because they're too gossipy and it's destroyed the culture. I don't mind. Yeah, but why are we doing this in church? Companies that cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars because of the gossip destructive culture. They can't trust one another. The scripture teaches, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood. Speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we're all members of one body. Like, are we really? Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. You start to get that? I'm not just pulling these out of nowhere. This is not from the Bhagavad Gita. This is from the Bible. It tells us truthfully. No one's going to argue that. No religion's not going to even argue that. They believe in truth. There are various practices of it. But without that truth, without God, without God's truth, we don't have anything. I'll tell you, one of the things that we, these are the areas we might want to speak God's truth in. If people are having trouble believing in God's love, they're going to be in a whole heap of trouble. If you see somebody who's just having issues believing God's love, you must speak God's truth to them, that God loves you. If you see people questioning that, you, got, you have an obligation. Because I'll tell you, when you believe God loves you, everything goes right. Second, do you believe in God's plan? If you see people questioning God's plan, God's plan is a crazy roller coaster ride of I don't even know what he's doing half the time. Just imagine having some of the plan being presented to you without you knowing the ending. You know what, we're going to take that city, but what we're going to do is we get the song leaders and we're going to march around the city. You're like, and when do we attack? Mm, I don't know. On and on. You know what, Noah? It's going to rain, though it's never rained before. I need you to build a boat, not near water. That's pretty psycho. Like, what are you talking about? When we people don't trust God's plan, we make our own plan. Do we speak that truth in people's lives? I'll tell you, Tony and Melanie, they're amazing things. They're very faithful people. For them to come here, the sacrifices that they've made, they're crazy. But crazy attached to God's plan. They've been in much larger and more powerful settings. They've had their bumpy rides. But I'll tell you what, the time that my wife spends with them, they believe in God's plan. And it just seems like a crazy plan. It really, really does. Well, we can believe in God's love and God's plan, but some people question God's power. You know, because I have a really great plan. My plan is to make $40 million. I don't have the power to do it. God has the power, the plan, and the love. Now, each of these truths, when they're emblazoned and blasted into the people, guess what they do then? That informs them how they approach people. See, we try to approach people in a way without God's love, bam, 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 without God's plan, bam, 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 and then without God's power, guess what happens? It's just yak, 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 yak. That's all it sounds like. When we approach people, the three truths, God's plan, God's power, God's love, when it informs when we speak truth to people, it's something that people want. Why do people come to church? Because they don't want to be open? I don't think so. 
That's crazy. You come to church, but part of it is maybe you're afraid. We haven't developed that yet. But what steps are you taking? What steps is everyone else taking? I'll tell you, it doesn't take very long for truth to transform a place. Jesus took a couple of years and he found himself dead. Then afterwards, these people start speaking the truth and it spread like wildfire. What's the difference between this church? Do you got the biggest band? I don't think so. Best facilities? No, you don't. Best looking <laughs> preachers? No, you don't. But what if you had something that the world lacks so much? Truth. So when we think about this, last passage we want to look at, we got to wrap our speech. Because right now, I, I, I made this mistake before. I've had a whole church go, oh yeah, I'm going to go truth everybody now. <laughs> don't do that. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, they're going to go tell the truth, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, yeah. kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all in perfect unity. If we can't go like that to the person who speaks the truth, don't. And get your heart right first, and then go talk to them. Then when you're speaking to them the truth and you don't see them repent, would you be willing to cry for them? As opposed to, see, I knew it. Hope you like hot weather, buddy. Like, it's, that's not how it works. When we use the word hell for anyone, it's got to be used wrapped in love. Or you're going to hell. Like, it's, it's, it's not the same, not wrapped in this. And so I think, just like any other little church, a little lie can tra- spread very quickly. A little truth can spread a little quickly, too. And I think as Tony and Melanie and the leadership here tries to bring truth to things that have not been going well, are we going to be able to embrace that, yes, we've missed out in understanding God's love. Yes, I am very weak in my faith when I understand his plan. I'm very not believing in his power. And it's informed how I treat people in the church. It really, really has. And I need to repent. And I need help with that. And so as we close, what battle do you have to fight for honesty today for you? Today. I don't suggest you do it here. You need to process it. I've had people do that. Oh my goodness, they're starting in the corner over there. I don't want that. <laughs> Go home, pray, look at these things. Read the story again. King David's kingdom fell when that battle was lost by all the people that watched him do what he was doing. And that man fell. And I'll tell you, it almost interrupted the line of Jesus Christ. But I praise God for his plan and his power that stopped all that stuff. Amen. Yeah. Tony, Melanie, thank you for the time that you allowed us to be here. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, amen. And all the best to Ottawa.